Now, you ready to get into the Word of God? Come on, I feel expectation in the room. I feel hunger. The Bible, an old preacher I listened to said the atmosphere of expectation is the, or the atmosphere of expectancy is the breeding ground of miracles. So I always say that um, if you get nothing out of church, it's not the church's fault. Also makes me feel better about myself, right? (laughs) But it could be that you didn't come with a leaned in heart. Because God always meets you at the level of your hunger. So uh, he says, draw near to me, I'll draw near to you. Come, in other words, come leaning in, come expecting God to speak to you, and he'll speak to you. So um, let's, let's look at the word, Acts chapter 12, verse 5. We're going to read one verse, and uh, we're going to pick it apart today. It says, so Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. Let me read it one more time since it's only one verse. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. I want to give you a message title called When the Church Prays. If you're a note-taking type, write that down. If you're not, go ahead and write that down. (laughs) When the Church Prays. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we ask you to speak to us. Holy Spirit, our minds and our hearts are open. We haven't come just to do some religious exercise. We've come to hear from heaven. So speak to us today, we pray in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. 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 Thank you so much. Can you thank your incredible worship team? Wow. Really, what a blessing. And um, how about Days of Hope? I was just getting, Pastor Brandon was telling me all the things that you're doing. How amazing. And to hear these reports, uh, really incredible that that you care about getting outside the walls of your church. Um, How many of you remember middle school? Some of you tried to forget it? It's a rough three years. Some of you are in the middle of it right now. So when I was in middle school, I grew up in East Tennessee, um, planted the church in Virginia with my wife um, 18 years ago. But I grew up in East Tennessee, right on the border of Virginia in the Appalachian Mountain where men are men, so are the women. And you gotta be tough. I'm just kidding. If you're from Tennessee, God bless you. I'm not trying to offend you, um, but you know it's true. And uh, so, but it's, it's an interesting place. And uh, so I'm in middle school. Um, the big thing where we grew up was football. And I, I hear it is in Texas too. But middle school, high school football was all there is. We had no pro teams where we grew up. So it was high school and University of Tennessee football, go big orange. Like that's all that it was, um, the other UT. And so that's all that you did. And so the work, the thing was nothing else happened in town. So you went to football Friday night and then it was school dance after that. Like that was what everybody did. So you went to the game, rain or shine, and, uh, and then you went to a dance after that. And so I remember one of the first dances I was allowed to go to, which was less of a dance and more of a standoff. It was like boys on one side, girls on the other, and a few extroverts in the middle that were actually dancing. Are y'all tracking with me? Now, I grew up in a very um, conservative environment and a church that you didn't do anything. Like you didn't drink, smoke, chew, or go out with girls that do, and you didn't wear long hair, and like, you know, you, you just nothing. If, if you wanted to do it, the answer was no. Are y'all following me? And so dancing, definitely you didn't do, um, and it's the reason you didn't have premarital sex, because it could lead to dancing. So dancing, some of you are like, he just said that. Yes, I did. I will go home today and uh, Pastor Daniel can clean up everything. So anyways, I remember I I was like, I finally got the courage. There was this girl I wanted to dance with and it was a slow dance because I just, I have no moves, but I can rock back and forth. And I was like, I know that's about all I got to do. And so I made the long walk over the gym because it was in the gymnasium. I made the long walk over um, to the girl side and I, I, put forward the request. I'm sure I fumbled the words, and, um, but I, I made the request, and, and the answer was no. Thank you. <laughs> so I made this long, embarrassing walk back to the guy side to then get hazed, you know, because you just got rejected on the girl side, and I never asked anyone to dance again. We worked through it in therapy. I'm good now. Um, but It was a major setback in my middle school life. Are y'all tracking with me? This was a big setback. How many of you have been in a a moment in life where where like 
everything can be going well, but you have some area that's a setback. It, it feels like this area isn't going well in your life. I know I've been there that I feel like I got different areas of setback in my life. How many of you know this, that everything in life can be going great, but if you have one area of setback, it it colors everything else that's going well in life. It, it can, the, the career front, the school front, the marriage front, and then the parenting front can feel like a setback. And the financial front can be the setback, but everything else seems to be moving in the right direction. And it covers or it, it shades or it, it brings down every other area in your life. And I want us to think about that as we look at the text today, because this is what the early church is experiencing. There is so much going right. And matter of fact, in the book of Acts, we get all these amazing stories. The, the writer of Acts is the Dr. Luke. Can we go to school for a little bit today? Are y'all, is this okay? All right, we're gonna go to Sunday school. Some of y'all remember that. If you don't, be glad. But we're gonna, I'm joking. And so Luke is the author of Acts. He's also the author of the Gospel of Luke. You really could read those two books together and kind of get a good broad view of Luke's perspective. He was a physician, so he's a very bright individual, and he's also a pretty detailed individual. Don't you want your physician to be detailed? Can I get an amen? And so he's a pretty detailed individual, and so he begins to tell us throughout the book of Acts all the amazing things that are happening. The day of Pentecost, Peter gets up and preach, and 3,000 people get baptized in one day. How amazing would that be? Not a month, not over six months, not over a year, not over the history of a church, but in one day, 3,000 people come to faith in Christ. And then he gives us all these, and people are being added to the church daily, and, and they're meeting in homes, and they're meeting in large groups, and they're breaking bread together, and they're seeing miracles happen all all the time and people aren't just getting saved at the end of a service on Sunday no they're getting saved in the office and they're getting saved out at the park and they're getting saved at the pool and this movement of Christianity faith is spreading all throughout the known world at the time and Luke is kind of giving us a blow by blow matter of fact when you think of Acts think about it like this the Acts of the Apostles are the actions of those New Testament believers and leaders in the church are y'all tracking say amen and so then we get to this verse, though, that says, but Peter's in prison. Now, what you got to know is back up a little bit. What had just previously happened is the church is on this massive trajectory, thousands of people. Some scholars believe that in the first few years of the church, it exploded by hundreds of thousands of people. So there's massive movement. And everybody is intimidated because people are often intimidated by what they can't control. And they couldn't control the church. And so what happens is the, the Bible tells us that James, this isn't James, the half-brother of Jesus. This is James, as in James and John, some of the early disciples. James has been murdered. King Herod murders him. Are y'all with me so far? I know we're getting into a little bit of detail, but I, I need to unpack this so that you can get where we're going the rest of it. James is, has been murdered, and the reason that he was murdered is because King Herod, and this isn't the King Herod that um, was killing babies whenever Jesus came on the scene. This is that Herod's grandson, all right? That Herod's grandson is a kook. <laughs> Y'all tracking with me? Like, this dude is crazy. And he is currently king of the Jews, but he's a little bit of an illegitimate king because um, he is been, he's kind of married into the Jewish faith, but he wasn't born of Jews. So he's not really a legitimate king, but he has the authority and the power. And so he's always trying to curry favor with the Jews and the Jews don't like this movement of Christianity. Are y'all still with me? Okay, I know this is a lot, but I'm getting somewhere. They don't like the, they, so they're trying to curry favor with the Jews. And so what happens is he kills James and they like that. And so he goes, oh, well, I went after one of the major leaders of the church. Maybe I'll grab another major leader because they're really liking this. And so he grabs Peter. Peter gets grabbed, but he gets grabbed during a Jewish festival. And so he's waiting till the end of the Jewish festival to bring him to trial. And so this is the night before, and we enter the text, and the Bible says that Peter is in prison, but the church is earnestly playing to God for him. Are we all caught up? Are you tracking with me? That's I just gave you all the cliff notes. If you don't remember those, that's how we cheated back in the day. <laughs> how many of you got school, through school thanks to Cliff? I don't know who he was, but thank God for Cliff. Come on, somebody. And so that's all that happened. The Bible says that the church is praying for Peter because he's in prison. And most likely what's happening the next morning is there's going to be a kangaroo court, not really justice, and they're going to murder Peter. 
Now, I love this text because the Bible says that the church was praying earnestly for him. And I love this because it contrasts the two. That Peter was in prison, but the church was praying. There's a two ways that you can use but, and that is as a preposition. You're like, I did not come to school. <laughs> preposition, or you can use it as a conjunction. A conjunction shows the two contrasting things that are happening in this sentence. And this is the contrast. Peter is in prison, one of their leaders. It's a major setback for the church. And their first response is they go to praying. They're a living contradiction. I want to help you understand today that whenever you face setbacks in your life, because you will, the Bible says that in this world you will have trouble, but take heart because Jesus has overcome the world. And you're like, can you be a little more positive, pastor? Yes, I'm positive in this life you will have trouble. But you have a, re you have a choice on how you respond to the trouble. You have a choice how you respond to the setback. And many times, and in my own life, if we're all honest, a lot of times Peter is in prison, whatever that represents for you. The finances aren't going the way I want them to. I just got laid off from the job. The church is doing this. The relationship is doing that. Whatever the circumstance may be, and a lot of times it's but I'm depressed, but I'm worried, but I'm lacking faith, but I'm just going to crawl in a hole and go away. But I want to encourage you that because of faith in God and the Holy Spirit that dwells on the inside of us, we've been called to be a walking contradiction. This is the power of our testimony. Whenever you walk into the office and they know you got the diagnosis, but you walk in going, but my God is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that you can. Hold up. Wait for a second. I thought you just got a bad diagnosis. You should be down and depressed and worried and discouraged. But no, I'm a walking contradiction. Peter's in prison, but the church is praying. I don't see the end. I can't see the light at the end of the tunnel on this situation. But I'm going to have the peace of God that passes all understanding. Fill my heart and mind in Christ Jesus. I'm trying to build your faith to see you can in the middle of a setback. Have the kind of faith like this New Testament church. When the setback comes, you don't have to default to worry. When the setback comes, you don't have to default to fear. When the setback comes, and it is coming, you don't have to default to, I don't know how this is going to turn out. No, the church went to praying. Peter was in prison, but the church was praying. The church was a walking contradiction. And it says that the church was praying earnestly. I, I love that they went to prayer because I think sometimes we, we say, I've done everything I know to do. I guess now I should pray. Well, I'm at the end of my rope and 21 days of prayer is coming. So I guess I'll fill out the card and I guess I'll watch the devotionals and I guess I'll engage in the moments of prayer because I don't know what else to do. But it tells us something that they went to praying. It tells us that they believed there was power in their prayer. It tells us that they believed they weren't just throwing words out into the sky. But they actually believed that, that prayer would turn something. See, when you do what you can do, it's the best you can do. When you do prayer, it's the best God can do. I don't know if any of you are football fans or remember this past season when DeMar Hamlin collapsed on the field. Unless you were living under a rock, I think everyone in America saw that, or at least heard about it. And shortly after it, I was um, on the way home listening to ESPN on, uh, on the radio on my drive home, just hearing from the Lord, catching up on sports, you know. <laughs> and, the, and, the, and the sports caster, the, the guy that was talking on this program, he made this comment. He said, how amazing was it that people in America immediately responded to this thing called prayer and how they threw up kind words and well wishes into the air. And I sat in my car and thought, no, 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 no. I didn't throw well wishes and kind words into the air. My Bible tells me that I have a God whose ear is not deaf to my cry, 
whose arm is not too short to reach down into my situation. I'm not throwing words when I pray into the sky. Whenever you go before God with your hurts and your pains and your desires and your wishes, this New Testament church wasn't just like, well, we don't know what else to do, so we're just going to go to God in prayer. And many of us think, well, I need to fix it. I need to manipulate the situation. I need to talk to so-and-so and and -and so-and-so, and I need to post about it. And I just want to encourage you that maybe when the setback comes, your first response wouldn't be to post or to call or to talk to anybody or your mama and them or your granny or your auntie or whoever that you'd go, no, I'm not throwing words into the sky. I'm calling to the God of all gods. I'm calling to the one who can stick his hand into my situation, who can turn around my circumstance. He is the God that heals. I'm earnestly praying. The word earnest there is the same Greek word that Luke would use whenever he's describing how Jesus prayed in the garden. It's the same expression that he earnestly prayed to God. That that there was such intensity and passion in his prayer to God. Can I tell you something? Prayer isn't a personality. Just like worship isn't a personality. It's not my personality to lift my hands. If the Cowboys win, it seems to be. Can you go back home? No, I got 15 more minutes with you. No, prayer isn't a personality. When you get desperate enough, you will move out of your personality into hunger, into God, if you don't move, I'm through. If you don't do something in this situation, the Bible said they earnestly prayed. They prayed like Jacob, like, God, I'm not letting go until you turn this thing around. I'm not getting up off my knees until you answer this prayer. I'm going to keep knocking and knocking and knocking on the door of heaven until that child walks back into my house and is walking with God, loving Jesus planted in the house of God. I'm going to keep knocking until this marriage is restored. I'm going to, this is, I'm earnestly praying. And they were earnestly praying to God for Peter. They were earnestly praying to him. And prayer is so powerful in our lives, not because we're just throwing words out or or simply even because we're talking to God, but because what prayer does is prayer will over time begin to bring you into alignment and into agreement with what God says about it. I don't know if you know this, but agreement is a very powerful thing in your life. The Bible says in Matthew that wherever two or more gather and agree... There's power in agreement. What is agreement? It means I'm coming into the same opinion as you. And some of us, we're facing setbacks in our life because we have come into agreement with everything but what God says. We've come into agreement with what your mama said. We're coming into agreement with what your auntie said. We're coming into agreement with what somebody spoke over your life. You've come into agreement with what your ex said about you. And you are not what those, any of those things say. You are what God says. And you come into agreement with what God says about you. But some of us, we've come in, and here's how I know. Because we've personalized it. We've personalized the word. Can I push on you a little bit? We say things like, my addiction. Who said that was yours? When did you come in agreement with the enemy to say that's who you are? No, you've been called out of that life by God. You may be struggling and wrestling with that, and you may not have found full freedom in that yet, But that is not mine. It is not my depression. Are you following me? I'm not coming into agreement with that. It is not just my lot in life. Well, I'll never get out of this. It'll never be any different. My mom was this way. My daddy was this way. My grandpa was this way. So this is just my lot in life. No, no, no. It is not mine. I'm not coming into agreement with that. I'm coming into agreement with what God says, that I've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, that I am the head and not the tail. I'm coming into agreement with the word of God, that he has plans for me, They're to prosper me. Come on, I keep going all day. Not to harm me, to give me a hope, and to give me a future. I'm coming into agreement with God that he so loved me, that he sent his only son to die for me, that I could have life. I'm coming into agreement that whom the son sets free is free indeed. I may not be walking fully in it now, but that is what's mine. I'm coming into agreement with God, and I'm breaking agreement with everything the devil has said about me. I'm breaking agreement with what every person is said about me. I am who God says I am. Come on, give him better praise than that in the house today. (laughs) 
You will stay in the setback if you stay in agreement with the wrong thing. And what happens in prayer is little by little, it begins to align your heart. It begins to bring your life into alignment with what God says. And when you are in agreement with God, there is power. There is power when you're in agreement with God. Come on, is this fun? Yes. Now, now we've shouted and clapped. Here's the other part of the story. Is that the church would not have been praying like that if there wasn't the pain of prison. There was no need to pray earnestly if Peter wasn't locked up. It was actually the pain of prison that purposed the church to pray. I want to read to you what the text says next, verse 6. Y'all still with me? It says, The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound between two chains, and sentries stood guard at the entrance. So he had two soldiers, he had chains on both hands, and sentries at the guard to guard him at the entrance. And suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter. I don't know if he, like, kicked him or <laughs> what he did. But he hit him on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said. And the chains fell off Peter's wrist. And then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals. And Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. And Peter followed him out of the prison. But he had no idea that what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. So Peter's like in between sleep and awake. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Come on, all the parents know. It's that moment when the child is standing quietly. <laughs> you feel this presence hovering over you. And you finally wake up and start casting demons out of your room. <laughs> and you freak your child out and they're going to need to go to freedom group. You know what I'm talking about? Like that, that's where you're at right in between that. That's where Peter was. It says they passed the first and second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself and they went through it. And when they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the, angel, the angel's like, I got you far enough, Peter. I'm going back now. <laughs> so Peter's in prison. If, if I could change the POV for a second. So far we've looked at it from the church, but could we look at it from Peter's side? So the church is under pressure and they're praying, but Peter's under some pressure too, is he not? He finds himself chained between two guards and he's in prison. And they've got guards all around. I mean, this, it's not like he was some mass murderer. It's so interesting to me how scared they were of the power of the Holy Spirit working in through a man. Man, may our life be so marked that people are like, don't even mess with them. There's something on them that they would, they would lock him up in that much layer of security to keep him in. They knew, they were like, crazy things happen. They escape, it's weird, like, <laughs> put a lot of people around him. And so he's under a whole lot of pressure, and the Bible says that Peter is sleeping. He's sleeping. How, how can Peter have so much peace in the middle of so much craziness. I mean, think about it for you for a moment. Peter had no idea what would happen the next morning. All he knew was the precedent set was that James was murdered. He knew he wasn't getting a fair trial this morning. That had to be a fact, but he didn't know what the outcome was, but the most likely outcome would be that he would be murdered the next morning. And the Bible says he's sleeping. He wasn't on Xanax. There was no hit of NyQuil. Come on, somebody. Like, he didn't take a shot of bourbon and just knock out for it. The night, like, but he's sleeping in between two guards. And I think it teaches us this, is that just because chaos is all around you and a setback doesn't mean chaos has to be inside you. And here's why I think Peter could have such peace in the middle of such pressure is this, is because Peter didn't know what would happen tomorrow, but he knew his God was already in his tomorrow. 
And here's what I want to say over your life today is this, is that in the middle of the setbacks of your life, you don't know how to know what is in tomorrow, but as the old song says, you can know who holds tomorrow. And that I think Peter knew that if the same God that was with him in the middle of a prison and the same God that was with him the day that he stood up and preached in front of 3,000 people and they were all baptized and the same God whose son would sit on a shore and call Peter back into ministry after denying him three times, that same God was already in his tomorrow and Peter is just like if he's already there then I might as well go to sleep I got nothing else to do tonight I ain't got no GameCube to play I ain't got no phone to look at I can't binge no Netflix tonight I might as well just rest and sleep and I just want to say to you that the God that is with you right now the God you feel in worship is already at your school tomorrow morning and he's already at your job tomorrow and he already is in every circumstance and every situation because our God is not confined by time Time, he's outside of time. He saw the day you were born and the day you would die at the same moment. And he is in all of your moments from here to the end of your life. And so let the peace of God fill your heart and mind, even in the middle of a setback. Why? Because he's already there. Why worry about what he's already working on? Because I want you to notice in the text, the church is praying, the angel is delivering Peter, the church has no idea. This is often how prayer works in our life. The church is praying, the angel is delivering, but they have no idea. Let's go to an Old Testament example. The nation of Israel is in bonded under Egyptian slavery under Pharaoh, right? 400 years, are y'all tracking with me? 400 years, they're under slavery, they're crying out to God. And the Bible says that the cries of the people have reached heaven. And so God talks to Moses. He doesn't talk to Israel. Because Israel isn't the solution. Moses is the solution. And so just because God isn't talking to you about the prayer you're praying doesn't mean he's not talking to the solution. Because he doesn't need to talk to you because you may not be the solution, but doesn't mean that he's not opening the door, doesn't mean he's not moving things around. The church was praying and God said, I got you, I heard you, I'm gonna send the angel into the prison. They had no idea, their prayer was already answered and they were still praying earnestly to God. And I just wanna encourage you today that your God is always working on your behalf. Peter, Peter, or the Apostle Paul writes in Ephesians, he says, I want you to know the surpassing, the surpassing greatness of his power towards those who believe. Did you know that that word power is the word dunamis, but a surpassing greatness of his power towards those who believe, and it says his mighty strength towards you. The word strength is the word energia, which is a Greek word where we get our word energy. And that word doesn't mean the potential energy, it means active energy. Here's what I want you to know is right now, in this moment, the active energy of God is moving on your behalf. Always, while you were asleep, the active energy of God, the power of God was working on your behalf. So your prayers are aren't wasted and your tears aren't wasted and the moments of faith aren't wasted because even in a setback your God is working and so your prayer isn't wasted when the church prayed God heard and God moves and the Bible goes on to tell us that Peter makes his way to the house he knocks on the door and the servant girl answers and she doesn't open the door. She hears Peter's voice. And she ran back into the room. Peter's still outside. <laughs> and she tells the people, Peter's at the door. And they go, that can't be true. Don't you love how real the Bible is? Yeah. This great group of faith, earnestly seeking God. The answer shows up and they're like, nah. <laughs> that is so us, is it not? And so she runs back and she finally, they said it must be a ghost because they believe that after you died, your ghost remained for four days or your spirit. So they were assuming oh, yeah, he's already dead. And so finally she opens the door, he comes in and he tells the story of what happened and he calms them down. And I just wanna to say to you, when you pray, don't be surprised when God answers. Because when you pray, God starts moving. 
And when God starts moving, miracles take place. You may be in a setback right now, but when you pray, you're going to have an opportunity in August, 21 days of prayer. What a great way to engage. Say, God, I'm going to lean in every day. I've never done it before. I'm going to lean in every day and believe you to move. Because when you pray, God hears and God moves. Will you pray with me? Every head bowed, every eye closed. Maybe for some of you today, the prayer that you need to pray is the prayer of surrender. It's the prayer of giving your life to Jesus. Maybe you've never taken that step. I'm not asking you if you have religion or, I'm not asking you that. Do you have a relationship with Jesus where you said, God, you have my whole life, I'm yours. You know, the Bible says that we've all sinned. That's not a condemning statement. It's the reality of humanity. And that sin separates us from a loving God. He never wanted it that way. That's why he sent Jesus. He died on the cross, forgave us of all of our sin, rose again three days later, proving that he was who he said he was, the son of God with the power to take away the sin of the world. He can do for you what you can never do for yourself. He can remove sin and shame and guilt and the penalty of it. And if you'll simply receive him by faith, that's how you receive it, by faith. So in just a moment, we're going to pray together. And that prayer will be your expression of faith. And I invite you into a personal relationship. This is your moment. This may be why you came. I'm not asking you if you've been to church. I'm not asking you. I'm not even asking you if you've been baptized. Some of you would say, if you say, I'm a Christian, you'd say, yeah. But if I said, do you have a relationship with Jesus? You'd be like, no, I'm a Christian because my mom was and my dad was and my grandmother was. I'm not asking you that. Do you personally know that your sins are forgiven? So if you'd hear and you say, Pastor, I need that. I need a fresh start today. In just a moment, we're going to pray. When we do, I want to invite you to join us in this prayer. And there's nothing magical in it, but if you mean it, you believe it from your heart to God's. On the authority of God's word, today will be a day of brand new beginning. Before we do that, I just want to know who I'm praying with at every campus. So with no one looking around, we wouldn't embarrass you for the world. But if you say, that's me, when I count to three, I just want you to shoot your hand up high enough, long enough for myself or your campus pastor to see. And then we're going to pray together. You just shoot that up on three. One, two, three. You just shoot up your hand high. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. I see you in the back. Incredible. You can put them down. Church, let's pray this out loud for the benefit of those who just slipped their hand up. Just say, Jesus, I need you. I ask you to forgive me of all my sin. I believe you died for me. I believe God raised you from the dead. Today, I make you my Lord and Savior. Thank you for a brand new beginning. In Jesus' name, everybody said a big amen. Amen. Come on, let's celebrate those who made that decision.